Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's science seminar. I am Jess Del Fiaco. I'm the communications manager here at the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. You are going to hear that abbreviated to CASC throughout the presentation today. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. I am very excited to have you here today uh, to um, listen to three graduate students from our network talking about their research projects. I just have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we are going to record this seminar, so please mute yourself and choose whether or not you'd like your video on. Um, the recording of today's seminar, as always, is going to be shared with all of you and all registrants via email. Um, and it's also going to be available on the Midwest CASC YouTube channel. And we are going to have time for Q&A with all of our presenters at the end of today's presentations. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat throughout. Um, but know that you will have some time to come off video and uh, ask your question directly if you would like to do that. I'm going to go through a very brief overview of our agenda today, which is pretty simple. You're just going to hear a few more announcements from me, an overview of our work, um, and then we're going to get right into student presentations. Um, so who and what is the Midwest CASC? So this is just a little bit of background on what we do here. Um, the Midwest CASC is a partnership between the USGS and a consortium of nine institutions in our region, uh, and it's hosted here at the University of Minnesota. We are part of a national network of these um, regional CASCs, um, all of which work to produce science that can inform resource management efforts and help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. And there are several ways that we work to accomplish that mission. You can see um, a few of them listed here. We conduct synthesis research on topics relevant to regional priorities. We support a network of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. We partner with one of our consortium member institutions, the College of Menominee Nation, to run a tribal undergraduate research program. Um, and actually that program has just opened up for applications for the summer's program. Um, I would encourage you to visit our website and learn more about that if you know any undergraduate students who might be interested in participating. Um, we host capacity building workshops and of course our annual gathering of the Midwest CAS community. Um, and then last but not least, we um, of course fund climate adaptation research projects and partnerships with the USGS. Um, you can learn more about all this work and current events by visiting our website, which is mwcasc.umn. Edu. Um, and now just a few announcements. They're all about our team. We are welcoming three new staff members to the Midwest CASC. Um, and then most of, most if not all of them, I think are on the call today. So if you'd like to pop a welcome message in the chat, you are welcome to do that. Um, we have Ali Scott, who is our Deputy Tribal Climate Resilience Liaison. Allie is gonna to work to facilitate partnerships and provide support with tribal climate resilience efforts. And then there's Stu Ratcliffe, who is a ORISE USGS climate adaptation associate. Um, he's gonna primarily support climate integration into state wildlife action plans. And Penelope Murphy, who is a USGS climate adaptation specialist. Penelope will provide climate information and planning support to the National Park Service, as well as general project management and communication support. Um, lastly, just one more thing that I actually don't have on the slide here, but I will drop a link to it in the chat just after this. Um, as of today, we have just opened up the job posting for the Midwest CASC research coordinator position. Um, this is a very important role that supports all the research that we do here at the CASC. So I hope you will take a look at that and help us spread the word so we can get a great pool of candidates. Um, so that is enough from me. I'm going to hand things over to our, pres our presenters at this point. Um, we have Alyssa McCulloch, Spencer Gardner, and Joe Murnock, and we're going to start things off with Alyssa here. So um, Just give me one second, get my screen share on. And you guys have the presented version? Yep, looks good. Great, awesome. Okay, thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be talking here and sharing some of the work that we've been doing um, with you guys today. 
Um, as Alyssa said, um, I'm going to talk to you about the effects of climate change on wetland ecosystems. And specifically, I use a water budget approach to investigate prairie pothole wetlands, which are very important migratory bird and waterfowl habitat, among other things. So in order to understand how a system reacts to changes in its environmental drivers, such as climate, we need to understand how that system functions and then place it into context. So in general, wetlands are comprised of physical, chemical, and biological components, such as topography, soil type, um, salinity, species diversity, and composition. And these components all combine to facilitate processes such as hydrologic cycling, uh, nutrient energy cycling, soil formation, primary production, species interactions, and dispersal and migration, which provide many ecosystem services for both humans, flora, and fauna. Now we can study these processes by examining the wetland water budget. The water budget tells us when the water enters and exits a wetland and where it's coming from. In prairie pothole wetlands, this budget is largely driven by precipitation events, which, depending on the time of the year, can result in snowmelt or runoff from the surrounding uplands and evaporation as well, straight from the pool or facilitated by wetland vegetation. Additionally, water can be stored in the soils, and when they become saturated, that water is going to pool on the surface. And there's also local and regional groundwater flows that can go into or out of the wetland. And if the topography is right, water can spill into and out of a wetland um, to and from the surrounding basins. And this all results in an ecosystem that is highly dependent on climatic conditions, basin morphology, and soil composition. And this is especially true for wetlands in the prairie pothole region. So a little bit about the prairie pothole region of North America. It spans approximately 800,000 kilometers across three Canadian provinces and five U.S. states. It ranks 10th among the world's largest wetlands, and it's comprised of rolling prairies with a high density of depressional wetlands, which creates this heterogeneous habitat matrix. And it's really well known for its biological significance in supporting many taxa, but it's gained a lot of notoriety as an important breeding habitat and stopover point for migratory birds, which has earned it the nickname, the Duck Factory. This region is located at the confluence of three major air masses, resulting in these decadal oscillations of drought and deluge periods, the effects of which can be seen in the satellite imagery on the left. It creates this wide range of pond permanence, size, and salinity. And we can also see this in the depictions of the Palmer Hydrological Drought Index. Um, anything above zero is a deluge period, and anything below zero is more of a drought. And as you can see, there's been this noticeable shift since the 1990s in the oscillations, and we've entered what seems to be this unprecedented wet period. And so what kind of a response does this have the wetlands had to this wet period? Well, this graph shows the changes in annual mean water depth in a sample of semi-permanent and temporary wetlands in the prairie pothole region um, from 1979 to 2021, blue being the semi-permanent wetlands and orange being the temporary wetlands. As you can see, the effects of the climate shift have had a significant increase in the water depth in both classes of wetlands, um, and it's been sustained like that ever since. And not only did the amount of water in the wetlands increase, but also the chemistry is changing. As the total volume of the water is increasing in these wetlands, the total dissolved solids, which we use as a proxy for salinity, has steadily increased and maintained higher levels as well. So one question that I'm asking with my research is, can we use our empirical understanding of how wetlands function to predict wetland ecosystem responses to climate change or shifts in the climate, like the one that we just have seen. So let's take a closer look at our study site and the tools that we'll be using to answer this question. This is Cottonwood Lake study area. It's a complex of 16 wetlands located in Stutzman County, North Dakota, and it's one of three long-term monitoring sites in the Prairie Pothole region. Researchers have been recording and studying things like basin morphology, groundwater flow rates, surface runoff, spill paths, and soil composition since the late 60s. 
And they've compiled these data sets on surface water elevation and chemistry, groundwater chemistry, and they've been doing vegetation surveys um, since the 70s, and they're continuing data collection to this day. So the map on the left is a hypsometric map, which shows the different locations of the wetlands in the study site relative to each other. And it also shows their elevation and their surface water spill paths. The highest elevations are depicted in blue, which moves down to green and yellow, and finally orange being the lowest elevation. Temporary wetlands are denoted with a T and semi-permanent wetlands are denoted with a P. So the results of these long-term monitoring efforts are um, have accumulated to the development of this hydrogeochemical model called the, um, the Pothole Hydrology Link System Simulator. It uses basin morphology and land cover soil information to parameterize the model. It takes meteorological inputs and it calculates wetland pool volume, which can be converted to other wetland metrics such as elevation, depth, or area. And this model was validated using this long-term hydrology and water chemistry data from six of those wetlands at Cottonwood Lake study area. So simply put, my workflow looks like this. We take those wetland parameters like basin morphology, land cover, and soil type, and we take meteorological inputs of a time frame that we're interested in looking at. And we put this information into Phyllis, and we simulate on a daily time step pond volume or other things that we're interested in, like the water budget components, um, for example. And I'm going to be quantifying hydro period response on a seasonal and annual basis. So this is what the water budget looks like when we visualize it over a 30 year period. And we can start to pick out certain trends. So on your Y axis, you have volume of water in cubic meters and on the X axis, we have time. Um, one thing to pick apart from this right away is that typically the gains and the losses into the wetland are about equal. So anything above that dotted line is positive or a gain in the wetland and anything below the dotted line is negative or water leaving the wetland. And since the losses equal the gains, this means that the wetland would dry up over the course of the year every year, which makes sense since this is a temporary wetland. We can see the relative proportion of each of the components as well. So precipitation and water coming in from the soil are the main inputs. So the blue and the orange above the dotted line. Um, and snow melt is, adds a fairly significant amount of water into the wetland in some of the years, but not all of the years. And that's the yellow above the line. Evaporation from the pool and from vegetation comprise most of the outputs in this wetland, which is the darker blue and the light green below the line. And to a lesser extent, this wetland is losing water to groundwater recharge as well throughout the years. Now we can break this down even further and look at this at a month by month basis in which we begin to see other trends. So again, we have cubic uh, volume of water in cubic meters on your Y axis. And now we have the months of the year on your X axis. So water begins to flow or move into the wetland as early as February when the snow melt, when the snow begins to melt and the soils on, on thaw. And then we can see in the middle of the summer that rainfall becomes the largest contributor to the pond until the end of the season. And shortly after March is really when we see the water leaving the wetland because evapotranspirative processes dominate the mid to late summer. And we are also seeing that loss of water to recharging the groundwater. And so now that we've established what the current, um, the current, what these components do under the current climate conditions, we can move to the next step. So using the same modeling workflow that we use to create those historic simulations, we can create these, or we can simulate these wetlands under different climate scenarios and quantify the response of those wetlands under those conditions. Using climate data from CMIP5 global circulation models, we've already begun this process. I selected the wettest and the driest scenarios to work with in order to get an understanding of the range of conditions that wetlands like this may experience. So here are some preliminary results for the seasonal changes of a temporary wetland. I have the historic period up there again for your reference. And if we look at these scenarios one at a time, we can pick out some pretty immediate things. So looking at the wet climate scenario, we can see 
that we have a longer and more intense wet season. There's about twice the amount of water going into the system than there is compared to the historic period. And it looks like there's hydrological activity all the way until December. So that's about a month later than during our historic period. And so looking at the dry climate scenario, we can pick out a few things right away as well. Um, oops, sorry. Which is that we have the hydrologic activity is beginning in January, which is about a month earlier than our historic period. And it ends around late August or early September. So a couple months earlier than our historic period. And overall, there's a lot less water in the system under this scenario. Now, this is just um, one temporary wetland that I looked at, and this is only the seasonal trends. And we're going to be looking at the the annual trends and the seasonal trends for not only temporary but also seasonal wetlands in the complex and the different and uh, wetlands that function different depending on their topographical position so whether they're recharge discharge or flow through wetlands as well and some other questions that we want to be asking with this research is how do novel combinations of hydro period and salinity affect the vegetative species composition and can we use the vegetation as a biotic indicator of these shifts that we're observing? Examining the water budget under various climate scenarios can help us understand how the fundamental processes occurring in wetlands may shift in response to climate change. We hope to be able to provide information that helps decision makers understand current and future climate scenarios and make decisions that are practical and sustainable. And that's all I have for you guys today, but I think we're waiting um, to do questions until later, so I can turn it over, I suppose, to the next speaker. Thanks, Alyssa. Yep, as a reminder to folks, you're welcome to drop questions in the chat and we will get to them later, um, or you can hold on to them and speak them out loud at the end of the hour. Spencer, if okay. you're talking, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, let's see, are we an image coming through here for the presentation? Yep, looks good. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, let me clear this up a little. Okay, so anyway, uh, my name is Spencer Gardner. I'm a graduate student working at uh, Purdue University and uh, also listed here a number of co-authors uh, working together in order to develop a couple of climate uh, hydrodynamic biogeochemical uh, and bioenergetics model uh, that it, we are trying to use in order to better understand uh, larval recruitment dynamics within Lake Michigan. And so this research was funded by the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center uh, with the specific purpose of trying to evaluate how past and future conditions uh, within Lake Michigan uh, may lead to recruitment variability or has explained uh, historic recruitment variability in two very important fish species. And so those two fish species are alewife and yellow perch. Uh, and so those will be the two species that we're focusing on today. Um, and a little bit of background is, um, you know, understanding recruitment, uh, the early life processes are incredibly important. And so uh, typically when we think about uh, population characteristics uh, for fish, they're often um, highlighted by high interannual recruitment variability. So simply one year there may be a lot of offspring that are produced um, and that survive to, to recruit to the fishery in other years uh, there's very few and so one of the main drivers of this is believed to be uh, differences in growth and mortality that vary um, uh, spatially and temporally and so um, we also see that uh, this is correlated to different abiotic and biotic drivers and so trying to identify the factors that are actually um, contributing to recruitment are often confounded through time and space. Uh, and a lot of previous work has went into trying to um, elucidate the patterns of uh, recruitment within the Great Lakes and uh, in the Great Lakes region in general, but, um, and there have been uh, many associations that have been identified between climactic factors and the density of age zero and older fish. 
Um, but oftentimes these mechanisms that are that are driving these relationships are often unclear. And so our approach is to use a series of models um, to simulate the physical biological coupling and mechanistically evaluate how climate can influence annual recruitment. So this is our modeling framework. We're using a suite of models to estimate growth and survival of alewife and yellow perch larvae. Um, and here we start with a model that uh, simulates the atmosphere hydrodynamic coupling. So how does wind, rain, cloud cover, et cetera, influence the hydrodynamic boundaries uh, or the processes, the conditions within uh, Lake Michigan? This then feeds into a biophysical model, and this biophysical model um, was validated by Roe et al. 2017, and this simulates a lower uh, food web. So it simulates the dynamics of these lower food webs that are primarily phosphorus limited. Um, and from this uh, model, we get estimates of zooplankton, biomass, of light intensity at depth, uh, temperature, and whatnot, and this all is carried over to a Lagrangian particle dispersion model. And this particle dispersion model simulates the transport of larvae from nearshore hatch locations throughout Lake Michigan. You can see in the top figure uh, on the left, uh, larvae hatch from these very shallow littoral zones of Lake Michigan as a function of water temperature and daylight. Um, and Throughout the spawning window, the number of individuals that each particle represents varies in order to capture the hatch distribution uh, of, a, of a population. And once these larval fish are released from these near shore environments, they're tracked for an additional 50 days. And so you can see here uh, two examples of um, how the environmental processes or the physical transport processes can vary from uh, throughout the spawning window. In the top figure, we're showing uh, the final locations for a cohort of individuals that are released on May 1st. And in the bottom figure, we're showing individuals that are released on June 28th. And so it's important to note that as these particles are moving, as these larval fish are moving from these near shore to offshore environments, they are capturing the environmental experiences um, at their specific depth uh, on a sub hourly basis. And that is what's being used to fuel a individual based bioenergetics model. And so this model was a, uh, originally established for alewife and uh, for yellow perch um, by Hook et al and uh, Fulford. And so you can think of this bioenergetics approach as just a bookkeeping exercise where we track energy gain through the consumption of zooplankton, and we look at the metabolic losses uh, that, are, that are driven by the environment uh, and size-based conditions of those individuals. And so during the IBM, we specifically calculate uh, uh, how many zooplankton an individual uh, may capture, uh, and that energy is devoted to growth. Um, and then we essentially have two various sources of mortality one being a size-based uh, or length-based predation rate, uh, as well as indices of starvation. And so this determines individuals, whether an individual grows or dies. And then at the end of the 50-day scenario, we forecast growth uh, using a fixed daily growth rate uh, and a size-based uh, predation rate in order to estimate the, the number of individuals that would survive to the, uh, to the following year. And this is how we define recruitment for this model. So again, the project objectives was to, uh, were to evaluate the past and future uh, conditions and how this influences uh, larval recruitment. And so we wanted to start off by trying to understand historic uh, physical, biological, ecological conditions. Um, and we specifically look at um, different observed uh, recruitment that we have seen in Lake Michigan through fishery independent surveys. And so analysis of those surveys revealed that um, eight years in total, uh, and we have four years that represent strong recruitment in both alewife and in yellow perch. We have four weak years that represent uh, fairly cold, uh, low recruitment uh, within Lake Michigan. And these years, uh, try to capture uh, you know, pr uh, pre and post uh, Kuwaga muscle establishment within the lake. Um, 
So once we establish kind of the historical uh, conditions that we're experiencing uh, in Lake Michigan, we try to forecast future conditions um, through the GLARM atmosphere hydrodynamic model uh, and trying to capture future recruitment potential for these two species. And so uh, we can use this model to uh, look at a number of different climate management scenarios. Uh, for today, we're going to be looking at a high-end emission scenario in RCP 8.5 uh, and look at comparing that to our historic years. So looking at model performance, uh, here we're showing the linear growth rate between alewife and yellow perch in the historic years. So linear growth rate shown on the y-axis, simulation year shown on the x-axis. You can see that these are two different scales between the two different species. Um, comparing between these red orange dots and these blue dots, we see that retrospective years uh, show or display faster growth than our comparative weak years. So our strong years that were observed uh, from field data also show up as strong years uh, in our model. We also see this slight decline in growth rate through the time series, uh, a little more prominent uh, potentially for, uh, for yellow perch, but this likely reflects uh, coagula muscle filtering and uh, decreases in zooplankton biomass through the the time series that we're looking at. And so overall, these are fairly small differences in linear growth rate. But when we look at survival, we see that uh, essentially these patterns still hold true, that predicted strong years still display greater total survival than our comparative weak years. Um, and we see that um, you know, between our strong year, uh, here comparing 1998 to uh, 1996, we see that there's a you know, very small difference in survival. Uh, same for yellow perch, around 0.3% uh, difference between the two years. However, this translates to, to huge differences in the total number of individuals that are recruiting uh, the following year. When we look at where these individuals are originating from, uh, we see that uh, much of recruitment is being maintained by uh, Green Bay, uh, shown in this first panel, and the southern basin of Lake Michigan proper. We also see that there's a large degree of interannual differences in regional, uh, the regional contribution of recruits between uh, the southern basin, the, the southeast some years is producing more recruits than the southwest uh, and vice versa in different years, uh, which is interesting to note. And we also see that these patterns hold true for, for yellow perch. And we see that between the two species and within each region and within a given year, very large different uh, variability uh, in total survivors. So some release days, uh, there's relatively zero survival, uh, whereas other release days are contributing large uh, number of individuals to the surviving uh, year class. So looking now at future simulations here, we have uh, linear growth rate shown on the y-axis, simulation year on the x-axis. Uh, the green dots uh, that are boxed in are showing our historic simulations. These historic simulations are often accompanied by warmer mid-century spring and summer temperatures. Uh, and our models uh, are suggesting that there's only a slight change in the future growth rate potential. And that is seen uh, for both alewife and for yellow perch. Looking at total survival, we see that these future years likely um, are gonna be accompanied by a modest increase in annual recruitment. So in conclusion, we see that the simulations, uh, the simulated years follow expected and observed patterns from our historic uh, analysis, we see that these strong years display faster growth and greater regional survival. We see, we see that there's a higher regional contribution of recruits coming from Green Bay in the southern basin of Lake Michigan. And we also see very large uh, intra-annual variability in survival between these different regions. Um, and this potentially underlies the importance of spawning phenology. So when an individual hatches, how long a uh, spawning window uh, occurs for a population and how 
the hatch of individuals could potentially lead to greater mismatches in the future um, between larvae and their zooplanktonic uh, food sources. So now that we've briefly looked at kind of an overview, our next step will be to, to look at the underlying mechanisms that are contributing to interannual recruitment variability within these uh, various historic years. Um, and then we'll also look at how uh, these future conditions change under different management scenarios. Uh, so for, for this uh, short presentation, we looked at uh, a high emission scenario, uh, but we'll be looking at moderate mitigation scenarios as well as potentially changes to the prevailing winds and how this might influence uh, offshore advection um, and whatnot. And so with that, uh, thank you. And, and I'll turn this over to um, the next presenter. Boom. Look good. Can you hear me? Looks good. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so thank you so much for having me today. My name is Joe Murnack. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center for Limnology, as well as a fisheries research biologist with Wisconsin DNR. And today I'm going to be speaking on an aspect of my dissertation research aimed at a proactive adaptation approach, whereby we are trying to build resiliency in some north temperate ecosystems through panarchy theory and the resist accept direct framework. So to begin, uh, climate change and invasive species are the large drivers of headaches in my professional life, and that is because they're driving ecosystem change and regime shifts right before our eyes. Uh, this includes alterations to habitat and resource availability, as well as changes or novelty insertions into our food web structure and spe species interactions. Um, and this is often creating a management match mismatch, where the systems we are tasked with managing are becoming extremely dynamic and may be self-organizing around new or novel structures or processes not observed, let alone recognized during our last management action. So what is something we can do to solve this very wicked issue of the landscape changing right before us? Well, I think food web thinking is the answer, which encompasses three uh, important ideas and concepts. The first is an ecosystem-based fisheries management approach, wherein management should target uh, improving or reinstalling these key ecological processes, habitats, and species interactions, rather than focusing on the single species, removing a single stressor supporting that individual species. For example, if walleye are declining in Lake A, consideration should be given to spawning habitat or forage availability before we just go out and stock more individuals into that lake. So second is panarchy theory, which is a transformative process that all social, ecological, and social ecological systems move through. And it's essentially a framework of nature's rules. And we believe that this framework can allow for management actions, such as a whole lake biomanipulation, to be leveraged against natural or even induced ecosystem processes, ultimately providing a greater likelihood of desired outcomes. And the final one, uh, which the Midwest cash should be aware of, is the resist accept direct framework, uh, where this framework can assist managers in making informed decisions on how to respond to undesired ecological change and actually provides a process to encourage management to direct that ecosystem change towards an acceptable regime. Now, importantly, uh, for RAD, the ecosystem trajectories, as well as the current and former management practices, must be fully understood to improve that decision making, thus the large call for food web thinking. So in concert, I strongly believe that these frameworks can help inform fisheries management, as well as climate adaptation strategies to benefit natural resource management as a whole, as well as the tribal, recreational, and commercial users of these resources. So what are we actually doing and how are we blending these three topics? 
The systems I uh, primarily work on are located in northern Wisconsin, Crystal and Sparkling Lake, and they're also members of our long-term ecological research network. So we have a really rich data set going back to 1981. Now, these lakes are very similar in that they are cold, deep, and well-oxygenated oligotrophic systems, but they do differ in their food web configuration, where Sparkling Lake contains apex predators, walleye, muscalunch, smallmouth bass, where Crystal Lake contains no apex predator. Further, both of these systems contain uh, populations of invasive rainbow smelt. Um, so this species is really good at coming into these systems and driving uh, negative ecological change. They can be responsible for recruitment failure, species declines, and in some cases, uh, uh, species extirpation from these systems, largely driven by their urethermal and omnivorous life history. So urethermal meaning over a life cycle of an individual, they'll occupy all available habitats within these north temperate lakes, and they're highly omnivorous. So if it's in front of their mouth and it fits within their mouth, they will consume it. So they have strong bottom up, top down, as well as middle out effects. So pretty wicked invader. So here we have a, a vertical gill net catch per unit effort time series for both systems. And the big takeaway is just the red line for each of these figures, which is our invasive rainbow smelt. So for both systems, uh, rainbow smelt entered the system and established about five to eight years after that. And then shortly after their estab establishment, they quickly became the dominant biomass within these systems, uh, noted by the declines in yellow perch and crystal lake, as well as the decline and extirpation of Cisco and sparkling lake. Once these rainbow smelt got in, they really drove this negative change. Now, there were two uh, studies denoted by the gray shading bars in those time series that were aimed at rainbow smelt eradication. Now, they used different methods. In Crystal Lake, they uh, essentially uh, destratified the lake, warmed the whole lake to try and remove them there. And in Sparkling, it was manual removals with netting, as well as some uh, additional walleye stocking. But regardless, both of those studies were super successful at driving population decline for the invasive rainbow smelt about 90% for each of those projects. However, rainbow smelt were never uh, fully eradicated from the system and the native species have yet to colonize that kind of uh, devoided niche space. So at a low stock size, there's still um, reason to believe that those rainbow smelt may uh, exhibit a compensatory response where they compensate for that super low uh, adult standing stock and throw out a massive year class that next year. Now with following those removals, that niche space is ready to utilize by those potential rainbow smelt recruits. So we think this provides an opportunity to be very proactive with our management strategies. So this is a uh, adaptive cycle within our theoretical panarchy, and I want everyone to focus on the top right in the conservation phase. This is where uh, ecosystems hang out in most of the time, where we see the structure and interactions bound, set, and rigid. The food web is more or less stable. However, at some point in time, a slow perturbation like climate change or a very fast perturbation like invasive species can cause a release in that system where structured interactions break down. It's kind of like hitting the reset, reset button on a ecosystem. Ultimately, res resources refresh, structure and interactions begin to renew, and then over time, there's abundant resources for those structure and interactions to begin increasing on, essentially building that food web into the conservation phase once again, where the system is uh, hanging out. So taking back to those two previous um, eradication studies, they entered these systems at a rainbow rainbow smelt dominated state. They inserted their chaos through different mechanism. Uh, they warmed the whole entire lake or they went out there and removed rainbow smelt, but there were no novel resource additions. So as the system released and began reorganiz reorganizing, interactions begin to renew, but the potential for the system structure is similar to the last cycle. That similar system cycle will set up uh, analogous interactions to the previous, likely culminating in what we're observing today is once again, this invasive dominated system. So where we are trying to be proactive is we're also gonna go into these systems and try and cause a release through manual rainbow smelt removals. But now we're also going to try and dictate system tra 
trajectory or direct that system by adding novel Cisco resources. So a native forage fish to the area that were native to the lakes before extirpation. And the thought is, is that we add in those Cisco during the release and reorganization. Now there's a new system structure available. That new system structure in theory has the potential to set up novel interactions, hopefully one where Cisco have a foothold within that uh, recently devoid niche space. And over time, those structure and interactions would become set, bound, and rigid. And given the native species resources going in, the likelihood of it falling out in a desired state should be higher than uh, those previous experiments. So here's a uh, conceptual model of our experiment that we got in uh, reviews in fishery science and aquaculture. And essentially it's just that we're removing rainbow smelt from both these systems, stocking in Cisco to both these systems. And one aspect of our large driving question is how do predators mediate these interactions? Um, and we do hypothesize predators will play an important role in this. So during our rainbow smelt removals, we're only targeting the spawning adult population. Uh, whereas in Sparkling Lake, when you have a bunch of mouse within the lake, those will also help biologically control the juveniles and sub-adults that aren't vulnerable to our remo removal gear. So we do hypothesize greater uh, Cisco introduction success and uh, rainbow smelt control success in Sparkling Lake. So now just very briefly, I'm going to go over uh, some of the manipulations in our field study and then get to one of our results. Uh, so we uh, live transferred the Cisco from a nearby lake, a uh, native population essentially trapped and transferred them. Uh, to keep it simple, it could not have been more successful. We had extremely low uh, mortality. We hit our stocking goals at each year. Um, so we stocked out these lakes at similar densities because sparkling's bigger, they did get more Cisco ultimately. Um, but we pulled these off the spawning ground. So they're all fully fecund adults and the sex ratio was right about four males to one female. So we are super happy with it. Uh, we conducted rainbow smelt removals uh, early spring of 21 and 22. Unfortunately, COVID stopped us from getting out in 2020. Um, but it's really a really slick method. So rainbow smelt spawn under the ice. Uh, so we use chainsaws, spud bars, knees, fists, and elbows, or anything we can to get under the ice and pull out some invasive rainbow smelt. Uh, we've been pretty successful at this. I think roughly 120,000 individuals have been removed so far. And then we jump into our um, sampling and baseline monitoring. In the springtime, uh, we characterize the entire fish community on our two lakes, and there's also three others we're referencing. Uh, moving towards summer, we characterize the whole uh, community. It's a whole lake experiment, so we do sample the entire food web. But most of the time and effort is spent on gill netting, which we pair with hydroacoustic surveys. And it's essentially a way to get you your pelagic uh, density estimates, which I will speak on briefly. So here we have our hydroacoustic uh, estimates for Crystal Lake from 2001 to 2019, where the y-axis is fish per acre or hectare, sorry. And uh, this is representing a pre-manipulation time period. And jumping it out to 2020, still pre-manipulation, this is before Cisco additions, before rainbow smelt removals. We do see yellow perch at slightly higher levels than rainbow smelt, but functionally speaking, we view those as one and the same. So then going two years of removals and two years of Cisco stocking, uh, we begin to see some very exciting results. So rainbow smelt are dropping off uh, following our large scale removal, and we're beginning to see Cisco come on into our hydroacoustic arena, which is pretty cool. It appears that survivorship is uh, good so far of two years of the removal or additions. And then interestingly and surprisingly, uh, the yellow perch are the native uh, Resident yellow perch seem to be responding super positively to this. Uh, we hypothesized that there was some sort of competitive or predatory hold that the rainbow smelt had on them, and that was lifted through our removals, and they've really uh, ran with that uh, available niche space and resources. So switching gears to sparkling, again, we have a time series from 2001 to 19 for our pelagic density. Jumping to 2020, still representing pre-manipulation and then moving on beyond some of the work we've done. Uh, once again, we see smelt falling out. Cisco seemed to be coming on pretty well. And then for the first time in this si time series, going back to 2001, we're actually seeing walleye show up in 2020 in the pelagic habitats. Um, so this could be indicative of some species interaction shifts following our manipulation, but I'll have more uh, empirical evidence for that once I get through some of my diet and isotope work.
So given the ecosystem shaping forces that climate change invasive species are bringing, we truly believe that food web thinking will be critical to the long-term sustainability of these ecosystems and resources, where we can begin to draw ideas <clears throat> from ecosystem-based fisheries management, panarchy theory, and the RAD framework to incorporate the ecosystem and food web into proactive fisheries management uh, and restoration decision-making, with the ultimate goal being of improving or reinstilling these key ecological processes, habitats, and species interactions. So with that, this is the uh, last year we have slotted for the manipulation. It'll be our last spring of uh, removals, as well as spring, summer, and fall data collection. But there is a chance my advisors will let me stay on for an extra five years. Um, so we started this in 2019. And to see the ecological change that we're really shooting for here, 10 years is kind of the minimum that will allow some of our Cisco to go through a generational, um, what have you. So there is a lot of desire to keep on this until 2029. And then uh, the manuscript directing ecosystem transformation through purposeful food web uh, rewiring is in prep. And then um, whole lake experiments are super, super challenging. They take a lot of uh, time and people. So none of this would have been possible without uh, everyone on the screen. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Joe, for presenting all that. And thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I think we can open it up for questions. So you are all welcome to ask questions in the chat or come on video and ask your question to um, any of the presenters. Joe, looks like you've got one in the chat. Yeah. Um... I guess I don't know what that Cisco population was like formally. Our hope is that if we can build a uh, kind of resilient stock with a few diversity in age classes, sizes, that potentially that would help. But you are very much right. We are kind of recreating those systems pre-invasion. Yeah. We do think that um, kind of diversifying the amount of in, amount of interactions within that food web will provide that resiliency and stability. Uh, when rainbow smelt are in there and dominant, there's so many interactions going to that single species. And when something bad happens, that's where you get the kind of negative cascading effects. But And we've got one, I'm guessing you want to ask a question, Owen, unless you just want to be on screen. Go ahead. I have a question for Lissy, Lissa, down in Missouri. Uh, yeah, Lissy, I was just wondering if you could give a little more kind of insight into some of the management and adaptation sort of uh, applications to your research and what are things that managers can do uh in the face of kind of these uncertain futures uh to manage for these um potential deficits of of pond water in the future that's a good question so there's a variety of different upland management practices that can be used um to change the, to affect um infiltration rates and runoff rates um so for example snow accounts for like 80 percent of the runoff um, that occurs during the springtime and so what some managers can do is they can put up either physical snow fences to retain snow in the uplands for a longer amount of time or they can use vegetation as barriers instead um, and there's also burning upland management practices that can be used to change the vegetation structure and affect those infiltration rates into the soil as well. Um, and there are grazing management practices that affect that too. So it depends on what the land cover type is and who's managing those uplands and then what their desired effect on, um, on which components they're looking into would be. Thank you. 
Uh, Spencer, there's one for you in the chat. I'll read it out. Given the risk of error propagation in linked models, what do you consider key uncertainties in your models? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the limitations for the IBM specifically, oops, oops, camera turned off, sorry. I think one of the limitations for the IBM specifically is that um, the, we're essentially generating bulk estimates of carbon that are representing uh, zooplankton biomass. And so even though this is represented at a very fine scale, um, our ability to partition that biomass into um, into an entire zooplankton community is very limited. And so a lot of these um, bioenergetic approaches, specifically the foraging model relies on, um, you know, essentially estimates with size dependent encounter rates and things like that. And so we use a fairly coarse um, partitioning scheme. And I think that might be definitely one of the major limitations for our model and potentially why we're not seeing such an impact of uh, oligotrophication of Lake Michigan on recruitment potential. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you. Uh, Joe, there's another one for you. Um, how challenging do you think it would be for current managers to adopt the proposed management approach um, or what potential barriers might prevent them from adopting it? Yeah, uh, super challenging. So Greg, my supervisor, he has me in the field two weeks pre ice out all the way to ice out to kind of collect this ecosystem data. That's not uh, realistic in the real world. So it is great for graduate students, this food web thinking, uh, but it's super expensive. It's very easy to go get a snapshot of the walleye fishery, say it's lower than your number goal, and you go add more walleye out there. It's really hard to inventory spawning habitat forage availability. Um, but the conversation has to start and we're starting it. So there is hope. Uh, Jessica, since you've got a question in the chat, do you want to read that out loud? Sure. I was just wondering if each of you would be willing to kind of step back and think about how your research, kind of like Owen was asking, fits in with management, but also how do you see this field of climate adaptation or the way that we do research in climate adaptation sort of evolving or changing? How do you, how do you see that from your vantage point as a researcher and an early career researcher in this field? So you can take up either management implications of your work or this sort of broader arc of, of what we're all doing here together from your vantage point. It's kind of an open-ended question. Yeah, I can try to tackle that one. Uh, so I think from a management aspect, I think, uh, as I kind of maybe poorly, uh, you know, conveyed, but recruitment's a very difficult issue to get to, uh, you know, to get to. Um, and I think that, you know, although we have had tons of different research that have essentially identified these different relationships with, between climate and recruitment, I think that um, being able to, to utilize different tool or to generate different tools, such as this model to kind of coincide with sampling, um, is is definitely beneficial. I see that from this modeling standpoint, the ability to uh, you know to investigate you know not only regional uh, patterns uh, that might be kind of developing, but also to to use this model to kind of generate uh, potential sampling programs for the lake. Um, and from a climate adaptation standpoint, I think you know, managers can use this information to look at uh, you know, the potential for um, potentially large swings that, that could happen with climate. Um, I can go next. Um, I'll talk about kind of like where the future, where I see the future of this research going. Um, I'm pretty immersed in the modeling aspect of things. I'm not very um, on the ground myself, but um, with the experiences that I've had so far, it seems like there's gonna be a lot of, there needs to be a lot more communication, a lot more back and forth between this top-down approach of modeling at these high spatial resolutions and giving more actionable information to people on the ground and making sure that those streams of communication are open so we are more so we can understand really what people the information that people need um 
for example, like there's a lot of global climate models, right? And so we have an idea of what things might look like, but what does that really mean to somebody on the ground trying to manage either like a single wetland or a complex of wetlands or a stretch of river? And so we have to be able to take those modeling, those big modeling ideas and focus them down to these local areas and give that information to people directly so they can work with it. And then as we improve our on the ground practices, hopefully we'll see that feeding back into these larger models. So I just see this really big back and forth stream of information and action. Yeah, and then just briefly for my stuff. Uh, so at the genesis of this project, I've been working with the uh, local biologists and managers in my area. Uh, so they more or less have been co-producers on this project from the beginning. And then, yeah, just everything related to our uh, kind of management approach has implied tunes and strong management implications. So it's very much woven throughout. All right. Thank you all. Um, I think we are at the end of our time together. So I'm just going to pop a couple of polls up on the screen so you all can tell us how we did today. Um, we can make sure we're doing a good job and bringing you even bigger and better seminars going forward. Um, I'm also going to share a quick reminder, if I can share my screen, um, of our next seminar, which is going to be uh, starting on April 24th. Uh, that'll be about climate adaptation financing. So I hope you can join us then. Um, and thanks again for joining us. And a big thank you again to our presenters for presenting today. It was great to hear about your work. Um, that's all. Have a good Monday, everybody.